Joe. Dan, you were correct. Not only was that song so appropriate because we will be uh, partaking of the elements of the Lord's Supper here in just a little while, uh, that song is so appropriate for the message today, uh, which I titled, That Legalism Has to Die in You, uh, found in Galatians chapter 2. We are working our way through the book of Galatians, the letter that Paul wrote to the church. And uh, so if you will, take your Bibles, go ahead and turn to Galatians chapter 2. But today's message is going to be speaking about the, probably the most uh, uh, unnatural thing that most of us have to deal with. Now there are a lot of, uh, if you can't take me out of the monitor, I, I don't like hearing my voice at all. But we can, if, just take myself out, that'd be good. Uh, I, I, y'all probably feel the same way, you don't like hearing my voice either, and that's perfectly natural, I understand. But today's unnatural. There are some unnatural things in this world. And some of the unnatural things are things that we say, well, that's, that is for the perversions of this world. That's the things that, are, uh, that we want nothing to do with. But there are some a- unnatural things that we struggle with daily. And uh, one of those is legalism, following rules. It is natural for us to think, I have to do this in, or- in order to be right with God. Or I have to to do these things in order to inherit eternal life. That's not me, I don't think. (laughs) All right. Uh, We have to do certain things in order to, uh, to be right with God. And what the scripture tells us today is you can't. You can't do enough. You can't be good enough. You can't earn enough credit to be right with God. First, for salvation. But then we're also going to see also just for righteousness sake. So if you have your Bibles turned to Galatians chapter 2, I want to invite you to stand with me out of the respect of the reading of God's Word. And we will read from verses 14 through 21. So here in Galatians chapter 2, beginning in verse 14, we read, And when I saw that they were not following the truth of the gospel message, I said to Peter in front of all the others, Since you, a Jew by birth, have discarded the Jewish laws and are living like a Gentile, why are you now trying to make these Gentiles follow the Jewish traditions? You and I are Jews by birth, not sinners like the Gentiles. Yet we know that a person is made right with God by faith in Jesus Christ, not by obeying the law, and we have believe in Christ Jesus so that we might be made right with God because of our faith in Christ not because we have obeyed the law for no one will ever make be made right with God by obeying the law but suppose we seek to be made right with God through faith in Christ and then we are found guilty because we have abandoned the law would that mean Christ has led us into sin absolutely not rather I am a sinner if I rebuild the old system of the law that I've already torn down. For when I tried to keep the law, it condemned me. So I died to the law and stopped trying to meet all of, all of its requirements so that I might live for God. My old self has been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. So that I live in this earthly body by trusting in the Son of God who, live, who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not treat the grace of God as meaningless. For if keeping the law could make us right with God, then there would be no need for Christ to die. Father, we ask that you bless the reading of your scripture here this morning, and we pray that you will pour out your spirit upon us and teach us from your word. And we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. And as we have been looking at our uh, theme for Galatians, by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, to the glory of God alone, according to Scripture alone. We see a lot of that played out today here in this passage of Scripture. And the first is just seen that we are justified by faith in Christ. And that's two of the very things right up there. Uh, we are justified by faith alone in Christ alone. Now, We saw last Sunday when we were looking here at the the first 13 verses of chapter 2 of the confrontation that needed to take place between Paul and Peter. That uh, Paul had to call out Peter. And he first does it face to face. And 
Here we see today where it, it's a, a public matter. He calls him out in front of others because Simon Peter had stumbled. He had made a mistake. Now, I, I love Peter. He's one of my favorite characters in the Bible. I have a sermon that I, I haven't preached here. I haven't preached in a long, long time. Uh, but it looks at, at Peter, and, uh, and, and it looks at the, the man that Peter is. And while Peter is a champion of the faith, and Peter uh, 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 a pillar in the church, Peter is a, a man that Jesus called out and used in a mighty way, Peter also had a lot of flaws, just like me and just like you. And, and one of the flaws that we often see is a lot of times Peter, uh, he was quick to stick his foot in his mouth. He was quick to, to go and, and do the wrong thing without thinking. And I know I'm guilty of the very, very same thing. I, I wish that I had more wisdom and that I, I thought before I spoke. Uh, but I guess when you have a pea brain, you don't, can't do a whole lot of thinking before you open your mouth and things come out. And, and I wish I had more wisdom to, to know what to do and where to go and, and where to be. And I can relate very well to Peter. And Peter, who was a man... Uh, who, who, who walked with Jesus and, and learned from Jesus and was called out by Jesus, he had his flaws. And even after being a, a staunch leader in the church, he still stumbled. He still had his, his mistakes. We read there in verse 14, not following the truth of the gospel message. That's what, what Paul is accusing Peter of doing. And, and, and Paul was not a, a, one of the original 12 disciples who followed Jesus. Peter was. And yet Paul saw the, the error, even the hypocrisy taking place in the life of Peter. So what that literally means, what Paul is calling Peter out for, is that, that he was saying that you're not walking in a straight path towards the truth of the gospel. It's not saying that he wasn't saved. It's just saying that right now your lifestyle is not living up to what you believe and what you teach, and what you've, what, what you've always believed here as a follower of Christ, you're not living up to it. So he's calling him out. And I want you to be, be aware of this, that there are times where we make mistakes. Not a single one of you is perfect. And yes, last Sunday, I, I said that there were uh, preachers, evangelists, uh, those who have a large platform uh, and and uh, are pastors of, of mega churches on TV or on the internet or are preaching to, to a massive amount of people and they're leading people astray. They, they have made errors. Now, uh, and, and then Brother Jeff did an incredible job last Sunday evening really uh, reiterating that. Uh, he, he wasn't in, in the service last Sunday. He, had, he was out running a lot of errands. So he didn't get to hear the message. Well, then he comes in Sunday night, and he preaches a, a, a follow-up message. I, I said there were bookends. What I preached and what Jeff preached were two identical sermons, just two different spectrums, and he did an incredible job, and he called out names. And on Monday morning, I walked in, and I said, Jeff, you did what I wanted to do. You just did it by calling out names. And I, I'm, I'm glad you did that. Uh, there, there are times we need to call out. Now, if a... a pastor or a church or a missionary or an evangelist, if they make a mistake, they should be called out for that mistake and they should repent of that mistake and they should get back on the straight path that leads to the gospel. But there's a problem is that a lot of these that we, that we made reference to last Sunday, they aren't repenting, they aren't getting back to the truth of the gospel, and they are leading people astray. Uh, it, it breaks my heart to see how many people are being led with all with, with, they have good intention in their heart, but they're following the teachings of, a, of a, a, a pastor in error. And that's why it was critical that Paul called out Peter. That's why it's critical that pastors call out their church members. And that we see the, the sin before us, the error in our ways, and that we repent of that so we can get on the, back on the right path, the truth of the gospel. Peter is now teaching at this point in his ministry that the Gentiles need to be more like him, more like the Jews. I mean, Paul said the same thing. Paul said, uh, uh, be like me as I be like Christ. And, and Peter had every right to say that. 
So what Peter's doing at this point is not be like me as I be like Christ. He's saying be like me because I'm a Jew and I'm better than you. And that's been one of the errors in the church for a long time. Oh, if you're going to come to our, our church, you need to be like us. You need to talk like us. You need to think like us. You need to like what we like or you're not welcome here. And, and don't you dare sit in my pew. Well, we have had this, this long-standing tradition in the church that we try to conform people to us. No, we need to conform people to Christ. And that's what Paul's calling out Peter here. We need to look like Christ and lead people to him, not to man's traditions or man's rules. Because what Peter's doing at this point, as great as Peter was, and, and one of the, the top ten men that I respect more than anybody in this world, at this point in his life, in his ministry, because of an error that he's made, he's leading people astray. That's why it's so important that we all guard our lives, put that hedge of protection around us so that we can't be led astray, so that we don't lead others astray. But then when we are confronted with the truth of the gospel, that we quickly ask for forgiveness, repent of that, and get back to where Christ has us to be. Well, after we see this, this confrontation there in verse 14, Paul then talks about, hey, yeah, Peter, you and I are privileged. We had benefits from our birthright. You and I were born into uh, a knowledge of God while these Gentiles did not. The, the Jews were born into families that, that already talked about God, and, and they learned Scripture. They memorized uh, great portions of what our, we know as the, the Old Testament. And they had this great privilege of, of already knowing who God was and what he was going to do. They had great knowledge of the coming Messiah. A problem is that many of them, a vast majority of them, were looking in the Messiah in the wrong place or in the wrong way. They weren't looking as a, a Savior coming to save them from their sins. Because they were thinking, I am a, a, a born a Jew. I have a birthright. I am already the seed of, day, of, of, of Abraham. I am right with God just because of my lineage, of my birthright. I don't need a savior. I'm looking for a conquering king. And Jesus came because we all are in need of a savior. No matter what your birthright is, no matter what family you came from, you may have been born of privilege. You may have been born into a family that had great wealth. Your wealth means nothing before God. You may have been born into a, a family that, that has a great education or great lineage great reputation in the community your reputation means nothing before god you may have been born into a family that took you to church as soon as you popped out and you were the first child in the nursery every sunday morning and and you were uh, 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 always there and always active and that's great i hope and pray that your attendance is not what you believe is going to get you to heaven. Your activity is not what's going to get you into heaven. But that you uh, had a, a personal encounter where you admitted to God that you were a sinner and that you needed Jesus and that he, uh, you surrendered your life to him and made him Lord of your life. And I hope and pray that you did it at a very early age because of that family birthright where you were brought to church and you were active, you were involved, and at a very early age, you committed your life to Christ. And I hope and pray that you never stumbled. You never had a, a, a time where you went out and sowed your wild oats. I hope and pray you stayed true to that, that salvation experience. But not many people can say that. Many, many people can't claim that in, in their testimony. Many people, uh, they did not grow up in church. They were not taught to believe in Jesus at a very early age, and they didn't trust in him. It, there are some here today that, that your salvation came at a later time in life. And you know what? No story is any greater than the other. No testimony is any better than the other. 
If you are a child of God, if, if you uh, uh, admitted to him that you are a sinner in need of a Savior, and you ask Jesus Christ to forgive you of your sins, and you surrender your life to him, it does not matter uh, what your story is. Every single one of them is important and is valuable to God. And every single one of you, every single story makes him smile. Uh, uh, Matthew West has a, a new song out, and in, in the, the course of the song it says, Your story to his glory. It doesn't matter what your story is. It doesn't matter what your sins are. It doesn't matter what your past says. God can use that all for his glory. And whether you are, uh, grew up in church because of your parents, or maybe you started attending at an early age because of some friends, or maybe you never darkened the doors of the church until your latter years, it does not matter. What matters is that you gave your heart to Jesus. If you're here today and you've never surrendered your life to him, then today is your day where you can begin a brand new story. Your testimony can be given to him where he is glorified through your life. So before this service comes to an end, I want you to evaluate your own heart and see if Jesus Christ is the Lord and Savior of your life. In verse 16, Paul calls out the very fact that he and so many others were living by the law. Living by the law does not justify us. It only points out our, our shortcomings, our failures, our flaws. We read there in verse 16, For by the works of the law no flesh shall be justified. You, you cannot justify yourself by what you do. However, you can be declared justified not because you earned it, not because you did anything, not because you were obedient to the law, but because Jesus Christ says, I make you righteous. I make you justified by what he did on the cross. His work was good enough. Yours is not. And so you cannot try to earn it. And justification is never earned or achieved by the works of the law. You cannot be saved because of how good you are. Oh, I got up early this Sunday morning and I put on my very best. I was the first one in my Sunday school class. I answered all the questions. I, I was the first one in my pew. And I kept my seat warm for the person going to sit next to me because I'm a good person. You can come up with all kind of good things, but your goodness is nothing but filthy rags compared to God's perfect standard. God is holy, and we are not. And you cannot be justified by your good works. But when you humbly come to him and admit that you cannot save yourself, that you are in need of a Savior, Jesus Christ, then he is the one who declares you righteous. He declares you just. All we must do is believe in Jesus Christ. And he is the one who makes us righteous and justified. So praise God, we are justified by faith in Christ. Not by works, which we have tried to do. So then in verses 17 through 21, he points out the very fact that you and I must die to the law. We must Put aside the things that are natural, that make sense in our brain. We have to die to the natural side of things and live to a spiritual side of things. In verse 17, he's basically is asking this question. If, if following rules is right, if following rules is right, then what are we doing? Paul and Peter and Barnabas. Those who are working there with the church at Galatia would all be unclean, and really, according to Jewish laws, they would actually be unsaved. Because of what the, the Judaizers, those who, who, were, who were claiming to do things under Christ, but were incorporating the Jewish laws to, uh, to I guess, to continue on their legacy, their birthright, they believed that the Gentiles were still sinners. And they could not be saved until they were circumcised. 
And what Paul is telling us here is that if the Judaizers are, are right, then Jesus Christ is wrong. What he did was in vain. What he taught, what he preached, the life he lived was worthless. But Jesus taught us in John 17 that all, belie all believers, Jews and Gentiles, can come together and should come together because we are in the body of Christ. And it does not matter what your birthright is. It doesn't matter what your legacy is. It doesn't matter who you, what your lineage is. We can all come to Christ. And so Paul spent a lot of his time and his energy as we read about in verse 18, trying to destroy the very things that he practiced and that he lived by before his salvation. In verse 18 it says, Rather, I am a sinner. If I try to rebuild the old system of the law that's already been torn down. If he goes back to his past, if he goes back to his, what he grew up believing, the traditions, then he's destroying everything that he has, has worked towards and moved towards and that the gospel of Christ has used in his own life. If following the rules is right, then there's no need to surrender to Christ. You just keep on being good. And see if your scale weighs out, that your good outweighs your bad. Let me go and tell you right now, it will not. Your good cannot outweigh your bad. I don't care how good you are. Because the only possible way that your good can outweigh your bad is if you are 110% perfect according to God's standard. And you cannot be. I cannot be. No one on the, who's ever walked this earth except for Jesus Christ himself can meet that standard. And that's why Jesus did so. He came and lived and died to be our sacrificial death. He was our sacrificial lamb because he was the only one who could be perfect and you and I could not. So, following rules is not right. The law only proves that I am lost. That's what verse 19 tells us. The law only points out the fact that I can't live up to that standard of perfection. We, we, we've talked about Ray Comfort many times in here, and I, I love his, his, uh, his way of sharing the gospel. And uh, one of his mottos is, we, he, he gives grace to the humble and the law to the proud. So the person who's already admitting that they're not right, that they are uh, 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 hurting, that they're in need of a Savior, they realize that they're a sinner, then grace is what they are offered. They are offered the, the grace of salvation. But a person who is not willing to come and, and humble themselves, and, and they're still living in, I guess, in, in a prideful state that I am better, I'm good, I, I, I don't need that, then what Ray Comfort says is they get the law. And he shares the Ten Commandments and uses the Ten Commandments to point out the very fact that you're not as good as you think you are. And so the law only proves that I am separated from God. I am not right with him. No matter how good I, I think I am or I try to be, it's not good enough. And it only proves my guilt. However, Verse 20 says that I can be crucified with Christ. Right, Joe? That's what you just sang about. I can be crucified with Christ. Verse 20 says, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So I no longer live my life, my way. Meaning that Christ himself came and died to abolish my sin and your sin so that I don't have to live my life and live it my way. But I must die to my life and my way so that I can live for him. I must realize that 
my ways and the things that I want to do are in contrary to, to God. And so I no longer want to do things that please myself, but I now want to do things that please Him. And the only way that I can no longer live my life my way is to let Christ live in me. So instead of having my way, I let him have his way. His way. His will. His love. His wisdom. His discernment. His path. His truth. His gospel. We must let Christ live in us. And then when that happens, and as our text tells us there, we belong to him. We may still be in the world, but we are no longer of it. We may live here. This may be our temporary home, but we will have an eternal home waiting for us in heaven. So in the meantime, while we remain here, we live for him. We live to please him. We live to glorify the name of Jesus Christ. Have you done that in your life? Have you come to a place in your life where you realize that you had sin separating you from God? You thought you, you were pretty good, but then you realize that your sin separated you from God and you needed Jesus Christ to forgive you of your sins. Many of you in here today, you've already done that. You've already made that decision. But maybe you're here today or maybe you're watching online and you have not come to that decision yet where you ask Jesus Christ to forgive you of your sins and ask him to cleanse you of your sins where you surrendered your life to him, making him Lord of your life so that you no longer do things your way, but now his way. You no longer want to please self, but you want to please him. If that's you here today, if you never have come to that conclusion, but you want to today, then today can be your day of salvation. Today can be the day that you surrender your life to him. He can become the Lord of your life. And in just a moment, we're going to stand and sing a hymn of invitation. And this will be your opportunity to surrender to him. I would love to sit down and, and talk with you and share with you how Jesus Christ can become the Lord of your life today. Maybe you're here today and there's another decision you need to make. Maybe he's telling you that you need to to lay a burden down that you're carrying that you shouldn't carry any longer. You want to come and you want to pray and just leave it for him. Let him carry your burden for you. Maybe you're here today and you say, you know what, God's been bringing me here to this church for some time and I, I feel like this is where he wants me to get plugged in. This is where I, I need to worship him and serve him. I want to become a, a member of Chestnut Grove and this is your opportunity to join our church. Maybe you're here today and you're saying, you know what, I gave my life to Jesus a long time ago, but I've never followed through in believer's baptism. Today can be that day where you say, I, I need that. I need to follow through in, in baptism. And whatever it is that the Holy Spirit is talking to you about right now, I want you to stop. Open your ears and open your heart and listen to him. He may be shouting from the rooftop and, and you hear it loud and clear. Or he may be whispering in a still, small voice, and you need to stop and listen to him. But whatever it is he's telling you to do, today, at this time of invitation, this is your opportunity to respond to his voice, that you do so as we have this time of invitation.